Hello, friends and enemies. I was always told to open with that because people have to figure out who's who. It's kind of fun. Um, congratulations, you found this room. <laughs> I know, it was quite the trek and, and way, I, yeah, I, I was a little lost myself. Um, hopefully, I'm really hoping this is going to be the funnest talk you go to. I was like, there's a lot of information and that's, flashing is going to be great. Um, but I really just hope to 101 intro, everyone gets a better idea of how Kubernetes works, fundamentals. That would be bad. I kind of need that one. Oh, ha, that's because I'm not plugged in. But OK, I'll just have to keep doing that. Um, but yeah, I really hope that this is going to be just a fun talk. Uh, we, we are going to build Kubernetes up here. And, and not build, like compile. Like you'll see functionally what Kubernetes does when you do things. Um, so that's me. Um, I'm on Twitter a lot. If you want to DM me, I have DMs open or, or ping me. Give me feedback. Um, I am also a CNCF ambassador. Nobody really knows what that means. But I'm in the group of ambassadors that kind of promote Cloud Native Computing Foundation's tools, as being one of them, and a lot of other ones. Um, so we're here. We do. Uh, there's a decent-sized group. We do meetups all over the place. Um, but it's just kind of a fun thing to do. I also wrote a book with Chris Nova about Cloud Native infrastructure. Um, so if you haven't picked that up, they were giving them away yesterday a little bit. Um, CNIbook.info has all the links if you actually want to go get one. Um, really appreciating feedback on that too. That was a fun project to do this year. Um, and then I also, I, I believe I'm probably the only speaker at the conference that has an IMDb page, uh, which is super exciting. Um, but I'm not here representing my employer or anything. I'm here yeah, it's gone. Uh, to help everyone just figure out what this Kubernetes thing is. It, I mean, it's, it's OK if you've been running it for a long time. We're going to go over how it fails, just some other things in it. Um, I, actually was partially inspired by the quote that Sarah had in the keynote today from Benjamin Franklin, where it was, uh, tell me and I will forget, teach me and I may remember, and uh, involve me and I will learn. And so that's really kind of like getting people involved in how this stuff works and, and visually seeing it. You can look at diagrams all day, but seeing how, where the failure modes are and what actually happens I think is really powerful. And so to do that, uh, does anyone, everyone know what LARPing is? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it's live action role playing. Um, and basically, you dress up, you go somewhere, and, and you act out something, whether it's Civil War reenactments or um, Corgis uh, do, <laughs> doing the great battle of Corgopolis, um, whatever, whenever that took place. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to do that here live on stage. I already have some, some plants in the audience. Thank you for volunteering. Um, and then this is my last slide. Everything else is going to be up here. Um, but this is just kind of a, a really basic overview of some of the components we're going to go over and some that we're not going to go over. Um, mainly the control plane is, is the back end of Kubernetes, what, really what Kubernetes deals with to make stuff happen inside the cluster. Um, and then we're also going to have nodes are super important. Anyone remember when nodes used to be called minions? I used to love that. Um, I don't know why. Just minions sounded so cool. Uh, and the things we're not going to go over are those add-ons there. Those are all kind of implementation details a lot of times. It's some of them, like DNS, is a critical piece of the infrastructure. But A, that's really hard to represent as a, with a person. Uh, and B, you can kind of switch it out. You don't have to use the internal Kubernetes DNS to, to kind of solve some of these problems. Almost every cluster will bring one for you. But again, you don't have to. Um, so with that, um, let me go ahead and show you how we're going to do this. Actually, wait. Sorry. Let me skip back. Um, Vic, you want to come up? So Vic has graciously volunteered to be one of my kubelets. And, and the kubelet is the process that runs on a node. Um, we're not treating nodes as cattle today. Uh, there's no, it is Texas, but there's no guns allowed. We're, we're going to take care of this. We like Vic. Um, so Vic's job as a kubelet is to run pods. And that is his, his main job. He needs to, whenever someone tells him, here's a pod, Vic makes sure that that's the thing that he runs. And he makes sure that always runs. And that's it. And he does other things when there's a cluster. But as a standalone kubelet, like you can take a server and run the kubelet on it, and you're fine. You can just, OK, here you go. Here's your, here's your stuff. I mean, it's, it's 
not a lot different than just running Docker. Docker makes sure that the containers that it runs are always running. Um, so in this case, uh, with, with Vic, we're actually starting off with, um, we have what we're gonna represent as pods. And so, hold on a second. I told you it's visual, come on, this is gonna be good. And let me tell you, having a, oh no, it has a hole. Wait, no, we're good. Having a bag full of balloons, like TSA, was just all sorts of fun. Um, so anyone know what, what we're doing here? What, what is this app? Python, anyone? Come on. <laughs> Went through a lot of effort to get that. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. This is like their color. Oh, there is a hole. See, I'm not that good. No, wait, wait. I'm going to tie another knot here. Or, you know what? I have a whole bag, so it doesn't matter. So we're good. Um, but this isn't just any Python app. Yeah, I think we're good. So uh, this is actually going to be super special because anyone use Django? And for some reason, I always just imagine that Django was like a dog. I don't know why. Like, it just seemed like a good dog name. So we're actually going to have Vic run Django and keep it running for as long as he can. And if something happens to it, it's your job to, so the kubelet, again, you keep it running whatever it takes. In this case, this is going to be a static pod. Static pods are just defined. My skills doing this while talking were not super practiced. Just, just FYI. It's like typing, but on a whole nother level. So wait. OK. His legs are upside down. There we go. There's the dock. There's Django. Oh, his neck popped, but that's all right. Thank you. And actually, Django 2.0 came out, so. Special little uh, in for you. Um, so as a static pod, you can define these on the node as just YAML on disk. The kubelet comes up, he reads from disk and says, oh, look, I have a pod to run. I'm going to run that thing. So he fetches it from the, the, the container images from the registry, which is going to be my bag here full of balloons um, for when other people come up. Um, so they can get their containers out of the container registry. Look at that, it's even Docker branded. So we. <laughs> but it can be whatever you want. You can tell it what registry to get the images from. And he just runs that container. And, and that's his job. Right? We just built Kubernetes, right? This is it. Kind of. It's not really a cluster, right? Like, like this is a server doing this thing. This is no different than when people used to go, people still go and Docker runs something on a box and, and it runs, right? It's like, okay, that's not very special. So the complexity comes when we now want two VICs. Right? We want two servers to run containers, and we're going to not manually do this stuff, and it's not going to be things on disk. It's going to be we're going to dynamically put these pods everywhere, and we're going to do stuff with it. So that's where etcd comes in. And to represent etcd, uh, probably need to zoom that in, though. We're going to use a database in the cloud. Right? That's it. Like, that's your thing. It's a database running in the cloud right there. Um, so, you want to come up, Elon? Elon is also going to be one of my nodes. Uh, he has graciously volunteered. So what we first need to do here, actually, I need to take out my notes to make sure I do this right. Because I forget things so much. That's, there we go. So just to make sure. So we're just going to keep a database of typing node. In order to identify these nodes, we don't want to just do host names. That's not, that's not really special. It's not always unique. So we're actually going to assign labels. That's how pretty much we do everything inside of Kubernetes. There's labels everywhere. If you don't like labels, you probably got to use something else. Um, and then we're just going to track what pods are on there. Uh, we'll, we'll pluralize it, because we might want more than one pod later on. Um, so first off, we have Vic. And we're going to the label of, uh, how about mm, hoodie? Oh, wait, I got it. And beard. Beard. I like it. OK. And he's running our uh, Shingo pod, right? So along here, uh, he is, can you tell, he's one of the new Amazon Metal servers. So he's, he's a Metal server. We're just going to say that. Uh, or Bare Metal, whatever you want. He's not running any pods right now. That's fine. He, you know, we haven't scheduled anything. He didn't have any static pods. We're, we're fine. Um, 
So let me, let me just add a divider here so it's a little easier to track. We also need to, inside this database, we need to track our pods. These are the things that obviously we care about that we're running. Um, And, and last thing we need to track is where they're, where they're actually running. So pods also have labels, and we track what nodes they run on. In this case, the static pod never actually made it into this database because it was just a thing on disk that we didn't really care about. Um, so if we want to, if we, we have these nodes now, we have a database. How do they know how to talk to this database? How do they get their information? How do they read what I should do? We need an API server. They, they're going to not talk directly. Don't hard code your stuff back to the database, right? Don't do that. So we're, we have an API server that sits in between. I'm going to play the API server in this, in this place. I am the only one that's allowed to write to the database. They're not allowed to. No other component of Kubernetes can write to the database, only the API servers. And so anything that they need, they, they read through me, and then they, they can write back any component. Um, unfortunately, you can't really see the screen, but hopefully we'll fill you in on some of this. Um, so let's go ahead and run another application. Uh, someone give me a language. Java's coming up. I'm going to do Ruby, all right? Let's just, let's just do Ruby, just because. I have red balloons. <laughs> uh, so Ruby is label red. Now what happens? Nothing. They're not, they, they need to look at the database and know, hey, what pod should I run? But how do I get a pod assigned to a node? I need a, ske I need a scheduler. I need something that actually tells me, oh, that goes here. And so Brad, you can come up. So I'm going to add another divider over here. Actually, here, uh, cubelets on the sides, if you can't stand right over here, just so keep it visually separated. I can see your screens. Yeah. Um, so. Go ahead and pick. Where should this Ruby pod run? It can be one of two. Well, it's going to need some horsepower because it's Ruby, so how about metal? OK. So go ahead and get in. There's a red balloon in there. Go ahead and blow that up and make sure it's running. And so oh, API server is going to say, hold on. And, and that say, hey, what's assigned to me? What's assigned to me? If there's nothing, they do nothing. If there's something, then they, say, they look at what they're currently doing and what's assigned, and they say, hey, is that right? And they, they reconcile. They say, oh, I need to do something or I don't. And that's it. And that's really like the function of the kubelet. There are other things that they'll do, like they'll have ping checks. They'll kind of notify through the API server to say what their health is, say what features they have. There are a lot of things like that. But in this case, we're, we're going to go a little simple. One second. Um, so. Again, who's actually creating pods inside the cluster? Is anyone actually like, like, I want this pod? It's not a really good thing to do inside of Kubernetes because it doesn't, if you want to scale it, you got to like manually do all these things. So when you actually want to make something that dynamically scales, you typically make a deployment. And what deployments do under the hood is they make what's called a replica set. Replica sets, you sell it how many it wants, and then that creates more of those pods. And it's, it's super awesome. So we're going to add another row in this, in this database. Of course, replica sets have labels. And then we tell it how many we want. So uh, I, heard, I heard Java before. We're going to go with Java. Labels are uh, big and blue. Uh, how many replicas? I'm just, I'm just going to do one, because I don't want to kill anyone yet. Uh, um, so. We now have someone told the API server, hey, this is what we want running. This should always be running in this cluster. Um, but now what happens? Nothing. We, we don't have anything that creates those pods. We just, I stored this object as the API server. It's in the database. But Chris, go ahead and come up, and, and you'll be my um, controller manager. You can stand there, stand here. It's either way. So the controller manager does a lot of unique things in the cluster. It's actually like four or five different things. Um, it's, hard to name things. One of the things the controller manager does is looks at replicas, or replica sets, and just figures out how many were desired and how many are running. So he kind of keeps track of what the, actually, I forgot. You're running that Ruby container now, so, or the Ruby pod. So there you go. I almost forgot. Good job. Um, 
So he needs to actually create replicas in the cluster. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> because we have, we have, he can look at how many Java replicas we wanted and how many pods are actually use those same labels and then figure out like, oh, hey, I need to reconcile that state. He does nothing else. He creates the replicas and then scheduler over here will then assign those. So get, go ahead, we're gonna say Java, give me a name. We'll just randomly name these things. Oof. Oof? Oof, like that, all right, that's cool. Uh, so this is big and blue. And then scheduler, which, which node do you think can handle a big blue Java app? Mm. I'm gonna say metal okay. again. All right, all right. So it's now scheduled to Elon, all the way at the bottom of the bag. You'll find them. No, very bottom. Can't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so while he inflates this Java app, um, <laughs> you have to make sure they're both running. So, <laughs> keep going, keep going. It's Java, you know? Like, <laughs> more, <there's, laughs> more, out of breath. Uh, so replication controller created these replicas, also responsible for uh, helping out when nodes come and go inside the cluster. So. <laughs> So when a node comes up, uh, Ian, you want to come? When a node comes, um, rep or controller manager is now responsible for kind of making sure that this, this state of how many nodes we have and how many are actually declared in the database matches. Again, reconcile state. Just figure out what's different and see what was desired and what's different. Um, Ian now came up. He's a, another kubelet in the cluster. And so we're going to go and add him. Um, Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll just give him the, the Kate's uh, label there. And he has no pods, that's fine. We don't, we're not gonna automatically rebalance, we're not gonna do anything else, it's just another kubelet no. in. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. Uh, so controller manager is then, does these, you know, adds these labels to the nodes, make sure, if you're in a cloud environment, you also have these, these cloud controllers that'll look at like your, Cloud API, if it's AWS, you're gonna look at the AWS API, make sure that that node still exists. And, and if not, delete it out of the cluster because you get in this weird stale state frequently if nodes are coming and going. If you're in an auto-scaling group, things change and you need to be able to reconcile that state. Just for fun. Another name? Not Oaf. You're a controller manager. You need to oh, tell I me what the, you're creating these replicas. Jenny. Jenny. Okay, so we still got big, blue, same labels. And scheduler? Obviously. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to Ian. It's really hard with two. So, so go ahead, your turn. You get, you, you get Java. It's, it's a big blue one. So yeah, we're just going through the cycle. Um, the other thing that the controller manager is, is responsible for, whenever there's a namespace in Kubernetes, there are uh, default authentication and tokens. Don't really go over that here, but it's really just how, what pods can talk to the API server. Gives access to other things inside the cluster. Um, controller manager is responsible for that. But the other thing we also wanna do is you're gonna create services. Services are how you kind of route, because pods come and go, so you don't really... Uh, so service. You're not going to uh, route to a pod because it can easily, what's up? What's that? Oh, you're right. Thank you. Controller manager, what's up? Yeah, sorry, man. So, so, so that's, a, that's a good point. Let's say nodes came up. Something got out of sync on the API, and you say, what, what happened? Like, what, where's the failure points? Okay, like, all of a sudden, no, I, if I look at the cluster, I have this many, but something else is wrong. You can know who to blame, right? You go look at the logs of the controller manager, and it's easy to tell, like, at that point. It's not the scheduler, because he's not doing that. It's not one of the kubelets. It's not me. Who's to blame, right? Um, they, they were supposed to tell me. So if there was a <laughs> reconnecting, oh shoot. It's a database in the cloud. Okay, good point. What happens if SED goes away? What happens? Has anyone ever had that happen? I did it. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's amazing. You know what happens? Nothing. <laughs> they keep running. They know what they're supposed to do. They had to do nothing else. It's fine. No one can talk to me. I can't talk to the database. You know what I'm going to return? 404. I don't, I don't know. 500 errors. Like, I can't do it right now. That's OK. NCD can go away. You can't change anything. The cluster will stay up. I had it down for days. It was amazing. And, and like, no one knew. No one, no one deployed anything. It was, it was amazing. SCD's back up. It's back. Awesome. So you're right. So we need, we need Java. Oaf is over here. And Java Jenny is here. So now back to our services. Of course, they also have labels. Um, trying to connect. All right. That's, that's fine. NCD is going to take a little break and uh, back with us shortly. So in the meantime, <laughs> Java got oom killed, right? Anyone? Java? Oh, it's like, yes. <laughs> who knew that could happen, you know? What's the kubelet's job? Kubelet's job? Run it again, right? Go fetch that image if it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you got to do as a kubelet. You know? like, luckily, I think I only have four of those. So, um, <laughs> But that's it. The kubelet's just going to go back in and, and run this thing, because that's the responsibility of the kubelet. And, and make sure what's assigned to you is what you're doing. If etcd doesn't come back, we're going to have a hard time. Um, wait, I'm online. What is this? One thing I will say, the Wi-Fi here has been very successful for me overall. When you get the, like, above the snow line in this room, like maybe not so much. Um, but anyway, so labels again. have or services have labels. One other thing that services have is they actually have uh, what they want to match. Because the service itself has a label. That's how things like ingress rules and other things will match. Because they'll find a service, which is a stable IP address. Um, but then we need to know what labels the service itself wants to match <clears throat> and what pods that is actually running on. So we're going to say, uh, let's say we have a Ruby service. All right, Labels for this don't have to be the same thing as what's in the pod. So we could say uh, gem. And it's going to match the, the label red. So we know controller manager, again, is responsible to the, for this. He looks at the cluster. He figures out which pods have those labels that we're trying to match. And then he tells the API server, oh, everything with this, this these are the pods that match that label. So which, which pod is it? I think we only have one. It's, uh, I can't read those. I'm sorry. sorry. It's, it's only Ruby at Ruby, this point. Yes. Yeah, because we didn't create that through a replica set. That was just connecting. <clears throat> Every time I just like glance at the Wi-Fi, then it comes back. It's amazing. I thought I had this off. Oh, I guess I, I should be offline. I should have done that. I'm sorry. OK. We're going to wait. Again, etcd's down. It's fine. We're totally cool. We can't create a service. That's OK. Everything else is still running. Uh, where's it going next? How about that Wi-Fi? How about that Wi-Fi? I was just you know, praising it, and then this happens. It's cool. We're going to wait for that, or we're so just going to move on. So if SCD is down, you say one of those other pods basically goes away, would Yes, if SCD is down, and that's what happened before, yeah. It, the, the kubelet already knows this is my definition. He can't get a new definition. You can't change what he knows. But he'll look at the API server and say, like, well, I'm just going to keep running what I'm doing. If I then start returning 500s to all these things, then they'll just say, look, I'm just not going to change. I'm fine. Like, I know what I had to run last time I knew about it. And I'm just going to reconcile that state and make sure I'm running what I'm supposed to. Yeah, OK, let's do it. Vic, go ahead and have a seat. If you lose a node, yeah, you can't change the state of the cluster. So yeah, that is a problem. Go ahead. You're just on vacation for a little bit. But uh, so what happens, because Django is out of the cluster, right? But Django wasn't a, it wasn't actually in the in part of etcd because it was a static pod. So that's OK. So we're not going to rebalance anything. We're not going to change where they are running. It's just, that's fine. Vic's on vacation. We don't really care about Django in this, play, in this case. It's all right. It's all right. We care about you. It's not that. <laughs> I don't know if I can take this. Can I like switch it to offline? I know. Okay, we're gonna keep going. 
Yeah. One more question. Yeah. So yeah, a uh, pod is containers inside of it. Right. So, so uh, for the containers itself, does it do a Docker start uh, of the terminated container, the one that died all around the example, or does it do a Docker run to? Depends. Anyone? Depends on the implementation detail. Your, your container runtime interface determines that. In a lot of cases, defaults Docker. If it's cryo, it's going to run a different command. If it's rocket, whatever it is, the, that interface, the container runtime interface, tells the kubelet how to interact and how to do something with this pod. And so if you notice on, if you're running Docker, you have all these pods containers, because Docker doesn't actually have a, a default way to make a, a, a group of containers in one thing. So they have this pods container, and they layer all the containers on top of it. Um, if you're using something like Rocket or Cryo, they do that by default. You're not going to have a pods container, because it just it can do that already. Um, so it looks a little bit different depending on the implementation. Okay, I'm going to fully turn it off and on again. Hopefully that comes back. Yes. Yeah, come on. Oh, offline, offline. No, that's wrong. Anyway. It's somewhere. Sorry. Whatever. <laughs> All right, we're taking NCD offline. We're, we're not running in the cloud anymore. That was databases in the cloud, maybe not so much. Um, <laughs> do I have Excel installed? I think I do. Okay, we're going to leave it right now. Dedicated nodes, yes, don't run in the cluster. Uh, so another, another thought is, how do, you, how do you have highly available API server? What do you do? Oh, sure, now you start. It's the only right, right. Uh, so we're calling this CD. Safe. Well, you don't want to do your cluster over Wi-Fi. So clusters over Wi-Fi, bad idea. Um, so second API server, that's all you have to do. Create another one. I'm just going to, Kelsey doesn't even know I'm doing this. But I'm going to share it with Kelsey. He's going to be my other API server, all right? And if I share with him, any, any one of these components can now talk directly to Kelsey. He has right access to this database. Still, no one else does. But that's all you do. And then you load balance your API servers. I don't need to know Kelsey's state. If he's down, that's fine. People, can, people will fail when they talk to him and, and succeed for me. That's totally fine. Same thing with your actual components. How do you load balance a API server, or sorry, the scheduler and controller manager? It, it's slightly different. You can add one. Right. In those cases, they can't, they can't directly, etcd is going to handle locks for them, but they can actually figure out master election in etcd. So they can say, hey, I'm the leader right now. Everyone else, you can only read. And so if you have one or five, it'll get a lock in etcd and say, hey, I'm the master scheduler right now. No one else can schedule anything. And that's fine, because you only want one thing doing that scheduling. You can have multiple schedulers. You can assign those things with annotations and, and run these things. But per schedule type or whatever, you can only have one scheduler. Um, so wait, we're gonna. This was okay. One more. Uh, we're gonna do one more thing here, and I want to show uh, Michael. Can you come up? You're gonna be my. Um, there, there's other things that, a lot of things that we're just trying to. I'm just trying to give some basics here. Um, Michael's gonna actually be my uh, initializer. Anyone know what an initializer does? It initializes pods. It changes them in some way. There are other things called pod presets and admission controllers. Those are built into the API server. So when someone says, I want to run this application, the API server will change it somehow by either saying, like, no, you're not allowed. Like, I don't accept that container. Like, I don't want Java in my cluster. I can say, no Java. And the API server just won't allow it. It says, nope, you're not allowed to do that. Um, their pod presets and, and admission controllers are really cool, but they're hard coded in the API server. And if you want to change them, you got to reboot the API server. You have to, or compile your own. It wasn't super flexible. It was kind of a, a, a V1 of being able to modify things as they came into the cluster. So they introduced recently initializers, which I think are alpha and 1.9. Yeah. Um, but anyone going to an Istio talk, that's what it uses. It's an initializer in the cluster. So when something comes in, one thing that we add to these pods to the right, is we add an annotation. So someone, uh, I heard go earlier. So we're going to say we got another one. Um, 
let's just say, yeah, we'll make it red too. Um, and we're going to say we want two of those. So we have go names. Go Bob. Bob. And go. Not Bob. Not Bob. Awesome. <laughs> uh, red. Red. Scheduler. We only got two, but I mean, it's Go Apps. <coughs> I'll play the real throwing job. Actually, Vic, Ian. come on up. You can, we can do one for Vic again. How about one He's on back. Vic and one on Ian? Vic, Ian. OK. So, but wait, wait, hold on. Because I have an initializer now, I have a config that says I need to initialize things. Literally, that's what we're going to do. When I create this thing now, the API server says, hey, I created this thing, and I have a config for initializer. So I need the initializer to tell me if it's ready or not. You can have multiple of these. You can chain them and say, oh, here's initializer one and two and three. So in this case, uh, Michael's going to say, OK, we need to actually uh, put an Envoy proxy on it. So we're going to run Istio, and it's going to run an Envoy proxy. So he would mutate these pods. And so we actually need to add one more, cluster, one more thing here. Yeah, go ahead and mutate. Wait, 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 we got it. Don't worry, don't worry, we got this. Java, containers in each one. But then uh, Michael here is going to say it's Go and it's Envoy. Go and Envoy. So now the container's in there. So do we assign it? Yeah, you're good. Wait, 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 hold on. Initializer then tells me, is it initialized? Not yet. Well, I mean, is, it in, is the object in the database initialized? It's, yeah. OK. We are, we are initialized. Go. There, is a, there are pink balloons in there. That is Envoy. Color coding, guys. This is good. If you rub it on your head really good, you can probably get this. And what color is Go? go oh, we didn't we can pick color. There were no gopher balloons. You know how much I looked for gopher balloons, and I could not find one. So, you know, so this is what we're doing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, we got two scheduled. So go ahead and blow those up. The cluster's going to make that happen. And, and this is what happens when they're creating pods. There's <laughs> only one left. Um, so one other thing that I noticed here was, see these labels on, on Go? We labeled it red. We wanted to match red for our service, right? So what's going to happen? Controller manager, does that match this thing? Well, no, the, the Go app is label red, and we yes. wanted to match label red. So now we have Go Bob and Go not Bob. But that's a problem, because the service doesn't know that it's a different app. The service is just matching on labels. So if you label something two things the same, your service will go to the wrong place. <laughs> that's good. I, got, I like it. <laughs> this is why this talk was really fun. So really, and that's, that is the job of initializer. And again, careful with initializers. If you make an initializer config and you try to start your initializer, guess what? He can't initialize himself. So there are some of those chicken eggs things you need to worry about. Um, you can tell it, I don't ever want to initialize this namespace or this, this pod or whatever it is. But that's literally, here's our kubelets. Here's initializer, controller manager, and API server. And that's Kubernetes. Thank you. Any other quick questions about failures or how a component would work that's not clear? Yeah? What's that? Node evacuation. Well, something labels the node as needing to be evacuated? Yeah, you can. So in that case, let's say we're going to evacuate Alon here. And we're going to say, hey, he's no longer schedulable. And so in that case, literally what we can do is we find any pod that was matched to Elon, the pods themselves that have replica sets, I'm out. the pod gets deleted. And then the controller manager says, hey, I need two of those things. They're not, I don't have two. It creates another one. The scheduler then looks and says, oh, I have a new thing, which kubelets are available, and schedules them. It's the same process. You, it just deletes a pod. It says, oh, as they're evacuating, we're just going to delete those things. The kubelet then says, I don't have to do this. Drop some. Fine. I'm out. You, know? you might say, hey, Vic, can you pick up the, those pods? 
Right, and then, and then if it's scheduled to Vic, we recreated that thing, Vic gets it scheduled, then he runs it. So, yeah. Ideally, so uh, custom resource definitions ideally would have their own scheduler or their own controller. And so those would, you would apply a, an annotation that says, I want to use, this is a custom resource definition, and your scheduler inside of it is only going to look at those definitions. And so the default scheduler doesn't know anything about your CRD, so it's not going to do anything with it. It's just going to say, hey, do I have anything that is, they actually will get an annotation that's like, hey, if it doesn't have an annotation here for a different scheduler, then I will look at it. But if it does, I don't care. I'm not going to look at it. They only look at their specific thing, and they do control loops on that. They just reconcile. All right. Please give the uh, cluster a hand, and thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>